to our online attendees as well. Um, in this session, session six, the focus is digital mapping. Um, I'm Rachel Murphy, I lecture in history at the University of Limerick, and I'm also the chair of the Irish Historical Towns Atlas Digital Working Group. So digital tools and technologies enable researchers to use atlases in new and innovative ways. So I'm very excited to learn more about the projects that are being worked on by our next two speakers, Dr. Brian Lamkin and John Elliott. As with previous sessions, each paper will be 10 minutes long, followed by 25 minutes of questions and discussion. So Dr. Brian Lamkin is our first speaker. Brian was formerly principal of Lagan College, Belfast, and founding director of the Mellon Centre for Migration Studies at Ulster American Folk Park, OMA. He is a long-standing advocate of comparative townland studies through digital mapping. In retirement, Brian remains associated with the Mellon Centre, particularly with Paddy Fitzgerald, with whom he co-authored Migration in Irish History, which I use a lot in my own teaching, and uh, he's also connected still with his immediate su successor, Catherine McCullough, co-author of Irish Historic Towns Atlas No. 18, Armagh, and also with new director, Liam Campbell, author of Room for the River, The Foyle River Catchment Landscape, published in 2021 all three of whom are attending this con conference, either in person or virtually. So today, Brian is going to be presenting a paper entitled Mapping Migration with Irish Historic Towns Atlas No. 15, Derry, London, Derry. Thank you, Brian. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so this, this presentation is... Um, is about a digital project that piggybacks on IHTA number, number 15. The, the, the paper atlas that uh, Avril Thomas edited in, I think, 2005, and then the digital version that uh, Sarah Gearty and uh, Dr. Lorraine Barry worked on for the, this was when uh, Derry, London Derry, uh, was uh, UK City of Culture in 2013. And we start with pick by picking up on the theme of fieldwork. Um, can anybody recognize anybody in the picture? Uh, and can anybody identify the point of interest at which the, uh, the fieldwork is situated there? So we've got uh, to the left of the man in the high, immediate left as we look at it of the, the man in the high-vis jacket is Paddy Fitzgerald. Do you remember this, Paddy? The, you... you <laughs> You organise this uh, as a, a public history, th these are public history students from Trinity, with I think the man in the, the mysterious figure on the left in the hoodie uh, manipulating his mobile phone. I think that's Kieran O'Neill from Trinity. And you recognise our keynote speaker beside him, looking suitably quizzical, I think, David. Um, so, uh, anybody, uh, and no takers for the location, have you watched Derry Girls closely enough? We're actually stood on this. We're stood on the plinth of the Governor Walker Memorial, on the walls of Derry, uh, stroke London Derry, uh, and we're overlooking the bog side and Free Derry Corner. Uh, it's just between the the the, 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 the um, you can you can you can just see a white uh, a, a sign of it down below. We'll come back to that later. So this project was really this. Um, uh, if I could explain that this, this field trip eventually got written up in this book, 2019, and um, as, as an illustration of the, the last third of this book is really concerned with advocating a citizen's atlas of local migration using digital mapping. Um, and it was, it, was, it was suggested to me that, although you t I talk about it in the book, uh, so on, there, it's much... It's very difficult to talk about a digital mapping proposal in a non-digital environment on paper because you're so relatively restricted. You can't demonstrate what it is you're talking about. So it was suggested to me that the book could do with a companion website. And that's what I'm really talking about this afternoon. So there's the, there's the uh, we'll try it at the end. This is like, like WC feels it's not sensible to work with animals, children, or websites in a live presentation. So if, we'll try it at the end, if, that, if, that, uh, if, that, if that's possible. But when you do click on that link, you take, get taken to this home page, 
uh, Citizens Atlas of Local Migration CALM, and there are four CALM prototypes to, to explore, um, which are discussed in the text. And the first one is called Derry London Derry, Still Under Siege. And this uh, refers to, uh, so there you are, this is, you, you hit on that, uh, the first prototype, and this is what you get taken to. You see Derry marked with a red pin uh, on the map, and there's some explanatory text on the left and the right. And I'm just going to read through the, the, the bit on the left. Um, this is the, the explanation of the vision. The vision is of an atlas that will facilitate the re-excavation by any citizen, young or old, of the known history of any point or area on the surface of the earth by, as it were, drilling down through or troweling back the layers of evidence from the present to the bedrock of the deep past to reveal a core or cross-section. It's anticipated that individuals will be particularly interested in the excavation of points that are relevant to their own migration stories, including their places of residence and sites of their political, economic, social, religious, cultural engagement. And the focus here is the still under siege mural uh, in Derry is used here to illustrate how such a point of interest might be excavated with a prototype of CALM based on the current Irish Historical Towns Digital Atlas of Derry, London Derry, compiled with the, the help of what was then called the GIS Research Unit at Queen's, colleagues of Keith's. So then you, 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 uh, you by hitting on the, um, the red dot, you zoom in and you, you bring up a photograph of the mural in its location, um, just outside Newgate in Derry. So the yellow dot indicates where the photograph was taken, was taken uh, and then you've got, you got it in, this is the beauty of uh, the digital GIS atlas that you can insert any file, um, any photo or audio or uh, video file or, of course, any text file. So this is what you're seeing. The, the field workers see from, they'd already had a presentation um, of this in that they weren't carrying clipboards or tablets or anything, but they'd had just had a, thanks to Paddy organizing this in Derry Central Library, they just had lunch and a short presentation with a PowerPoint uh, going through some of this already. That's, that was the background they had. So this is the view that you get, the visitor that walks the walls gets, um, you're now on the, you're looking down towards the river, d straight down the street, which is called Hawkins Street. And I just want to point out, see if you can capture a visual map in your minds of, uh, I've given you five points here, but the crucial ones are one, two, and three. So one is the, the mural, which says, um, London Derry loyalists still under siege, no surrender. Um, the, and point number two is the corner of Fountain Street and Hawkins Street. And point number four is this, di the discoloration, this discolored area is uh, indicative of this. This is a traditional bonfire site. So there are traditional, the apprentice boys light bonfires here on the, um, the second s Saturday in August to commemorate the relief of the siege and then in the first Saturday, in the first Saturday of December, to commemorate the shutting of the gates in, 16, in December 1688. And number five is the townland of Governor Scale on the far side of it. It's on the city side, uh, on the water side, uh, on the east bank uh, of Derry. And of course, it was pointed out to us by our guide. I should have introduced our guide earlier on. The guy in the high vis jacket is Mark Lusby, uh, who's our guide for the afternoon. So he uh, describes himself as a a historical researcher and uh, heritage activist. Um, he, when, you know, he, the, if, there's, he, if there's anything to know about the history of the walls, I think he knows it. So what we were interested in doing was drilling down, that point of interest is number one, but um, how long has it been there? When was it born? Um, and we might think at the end about what might happen to it next. But it's possible by, with the help of Mark, it was possible to uh, locate this photograph taken in 2006. That previous one was taken in 2015. But the, 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 the in 2006, the mural wasn't there. This is the corner of Hawkins Street and Fountain Street. What you're looking at is the, the brick building is the, the uh, dilapidated remains of the old um, fire brigade state fire station. 
and the, uh, the later building is an electricity substation. And uh, Mark explained that um, there were plans to redevelop this site, but the, the, the mural was so important that the deal was that uh, they would build a wall that would be visible from the walls onto which the mural could be transpired because we're in the district called the Fountain District, Fountain Street Clue, but it's the one remaining mo uh, Protestant majority district on the city side in Derry. So there it was, so sometime between, uh, between 2015, 2006 and 2015, not sure quite exactly when, that mural shifted and that site was redeveloped. We can take it back, thanks to Peter Maloney's photographs, a huge collection of uh, 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 um, photographs and other material relating to, to Derry that he's now donated to Derry Museums and to Derry Library. Um, but this photograph, uh, th the big one, is, is 1990. You see it's on the wall of number 18 Hawkins Street. And an earlier photograph that uh, Maloney has is 1988. And you can see it was, it was there in 1988, but with the Union Jack above it. So at some stage between 88, 90, 88 and 90, the Union Jack gets removed. And Mark Lusby told us that he, also, he has a photograph of it there on that location in... Uh, in 1978 and he explained to us that it was put up as an answer to another the other uh, famous mural in Derry that we've already referred to the the mural on Free Derry Corner that went up in um, that the first painting of the mural on the gable end of 33 Lecky Road was done in in uh, January 1969 so you've got two sides of the walls you've got Free Derry Corner there this is the loyalist Protestant uh, Unionist answer on the other side. Um, now, this is where the IHTA comes in. So we've got a migration story for this uh, mural moving from, uh, from the gable end of, of a 18 Hawkins Street up to the corner of Fountain Street and down to its present location on the purpose-built wall facing Newgate, which is the yellow point. And then we can drill to start drilling down through the layers of uh, the IHTA. So we can, here, here's that, uh, if we go to the key map of the, the Derry Atlas, about 1831, you can see the situation. If you follow the arrows there, you can see its move, what was there in 1831 um, from, from the, the, the two moves that have been made, so been mapped onto the, the site. And if we go back further again to the volunteer map of 1780, you can see, well, at first it's uh, Hawkins Street is spelt Hackins is Lane. I think on the previous one, I think it's, uh, you see that it's Cunningham's Lane. So there's a, a change. Um, you can see that there, there does seem to be a gap in the wall at, uh, the, there's Newgate is marked on the 1831 map, but it doesn't seem to be marked on the uh, seven, uh, 1780 map. And then we can go back furthest of all to the earliest map, the Raven map, 1622. And you can use this wonderful facility, which I think is a great metaphor for the idea of excavating or boring down, or it's a window on the past. So what you've got there is the ability to, uh, as it were, drill down on, onto the site of those, uh, the sites at which the, the mural has occupied or is occupying and see where that is in 1622 and it's outside the walls there doesn't seem to be any housing and it's just marked gardens outside so that's the guiding metaphor behind this approach to providing a digital access to the history the migration story of this particular mural and of course in principle that could be it could be St James's Gate that uh, Bernadette talked about or it could be the roundhouse or it could be people the migration story of people who are attached to particular places of residence um, so just to finish, uh, there, there's Mark Lusby again gesticulating from, you can see Free Dairy Corner down below him there more, more clearly, and he's talking about, we've got an audio clip of him talking about the, the history of the mural, and, and he says this, uh, speak his words here, although we have got an audio clip, we would actually, uh, he talks about the fire station, the electricity substation, and we would actually build a blank wall for the community to relocate their mural the graffiti on Free Dairy Corner says, you are now entering Free Dairy, 
This is the loyalist response to that. It was important for them to have that facing the tourists on the walls to counterbalance what the Republicans are giving to the tourists in the bog side. So this is about balancing narratives. And there's more. Um, so just to finish and say, this is the archaeology of my interest in this, this kind of digital resource. As an article in Familia in 1998 proposing uh, a digital approach to townland studies. And then it's developed in the book here, and there's a more recent article, a review article in Familia 2021. Um, so there's the website. I'm going to click on it now and see if anything happens. But I'm, if I'm trying to sum it up, sorry. Um, I, maybe I can I use the cursor there? Yeah, yeah. But it, it might not work. But anyway, just I could leave it there long enough for you to make a note for future <laughs> reference. Um, and just say, well, this is about, uh, tr if you're trying to sum up this approach, it's about integrating systematic, comparative Irish historical towns atlas and townland studies through digital mapping. I'll stop there. <laughs> Not connected. So, anyway, sorry, that's a bit of commercial. That you can do. Thanks very much, Brian. That was uh, fascinating, and I'm sure there'll be lots of questions uh, after the second uh, presentation. Um, so our second speaker is John Elliott. John is an independent scholar who holds a BA in Archaeology and Classical Civilizations from MUI Galway, an MA in Archaeological Excavations from UCC, and a Diploma in Digital Fabrication from the University of Limerick. John's research interest is the development of medieval and early modern Limerick City, and he's the author of Medieval Limerick Today, published in 2009. John has worked on numerous excavations throughout the country, and he's a researcher and member of the Executive Committee of Limerick Civic Trust, a researcher and administrator on EU projects for Limerick City and County Council, and he's a researcher on the Digital Atlas of Limerick Project for Limerick Museum. He is also PRO for Thomond Archaeological and Historical Society. And he's currently preparing a book on the history and development of the city and liberties of Limerick. So today, John is going to be presenting um, for us a paper entitled Sites Unknown, Reconstructing a Lost Streetscape. Thank you, John. Thanks very much, Rachel. I would say that I'm not, I don't have all of those qualifications and jobs at the same time. They're kind of <laughs> concurrent. I'm, I'm a busy man, but not that busy. So uh, thank you very much for us for, for being keeping um, involved uh, this late in the afternoon. I hope you're uh, kind of like, it's lovely to be back in, in Academy House. Um, my research, research history in um, medieval and early modern Limerick that Rachel mentioned um, comes back from a long period in my, in my time when I did a research project for the Limerick Civic Trust in 2009. Um, and then concurrently in the same year when the fascicle for Limerick uh, Volume 21 by Eamon Flaherty was published. Um, as Howard mentioned earlier, it's sometimes the first time when you have large format uh, and accurate maps uh, available to members of the public that you're used to going to local libraries where you often just get photocopies of photocopies of older maps. So having the high detail uh, maps is incredibly important. Um, and one of the main uh, things we saw in the Limerick Fascicle just on the right here is from uh, George Wilkinson. It just refers to a view of a street in Limerick in the year of about uh, 1845. And it just shows that the, 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 the scale and scope of the, the, the streetscape of the high street of Limerick between four and five storeys, stone walls, the property and barrage plots are of med medieval date, but then they're refaced in brick um, in the Flemish style in the early to mid 18th century. Later on, many of them had a parapet cut to make them more fashionable in the high to mid Georgian period, so to keep up with the uh, development of uh, Newtown Perry, um, which would be the the streetscape I would be talking to about would be the High Street of Limerick, which is now Nicholas Street and Mary Street. Uh, but that High Street, the main economic core of the city, um, by uh, post-1760, um, as Brendan had mentioned before, Newtown Parry was being built. So the economic core of the town was being moved. So I w want to know if you could map the resurgence of a High Street uh, after the Williamite and Cromwellian sieges in the 17th century through to the new influx of uh, kind of uh, Dutch and Protestant um, architecture and tradesmen. But then uh, again, the decline following that um, as the town centre moves uh, across the Abbey River onto South Prior's Land. 
So the Digital Atlas project uh, was funded by the Limerick Museum and the Heritage Council and I worked on it from 2015-2018. Um, I'd like to obviously take this opportunity to thank uh, Brian Hodgson, the former curator of Limerick Museum, his successor uh, uh, Dr Matthew Potter and also to Sarah McCutcheon who is the uh, City and County Archaeologist for um, uh, Limerick City and County Council. Um, it was a, an idea that Brian Hodgson had many years previously of he knew that in the Registry of Deeds in Henrietta Street there is a huge, massive, almost untapped um, uh, amount of knowledge. Um, they referred to, as you see in the photograph on the left, they referred to as tombstones and, and the quote at the bottom from uh, William Nolan, Tracing the Past, is, this is referred to as an intimidating mass of primary source material which has repelled all but the most assiduous researchers. Uh, to me that sounds a bit more like a challenge than anything else. And the Registry of Deeds um, from 1708 onwards. Um, most researchers are looking at a particular house, like the Roundhouse, or they're looking for genealogical um, uh, data, like uh, Nick Redden's uh, wonderful website and uh, database of, uh, of a registry of deeds. But I wanted to ask the question, can you, how much of a street can you find in the registry of deeds and unpick? Because the deeds, uh, memorials, they're unmapped, they're, they will, all that and those that will refer to the, the owner, the occupier, often they will show which side the street is on, and often and most importantly, the, the buildings to the north and south or east and west. So you might be able to one by one and kind of hopefully join up them all up. Um, as has been mentioned in previous uh, lectures, and one of the problems with having been near the end of uh, the lecture, so you can see the problem often with digital mapping is that you see Tom Core Castle on the junction of Munger Street and John Street. We have the ITM, the inverse uh, Irish Transwork from Mercator, where it should be at this point here, we can see at the top. But if you go between different maps, which are surveyed at different times and by and different materials and in different reasons over periods, that dot, which is located, moves. So you have to unstitch the palimpsest, um, which is one of the, the main focuses of uh, digital, map, digital mapping. Um, the primary focus for even just starting to think can you understand to start doing a, a, a research project like that was through things like Jerry Joyce's book and Limerick Street Names and most, most importantly the Historic Times Atlas um, Gazetteer of Streets and Lanes. So if you only have just written descriptive um, uh, references to buildings and there's no maps accompanying them, how do you know uh, which street is which or which lane is which? And streets can be widened losing a plot on one side, streets can be shortened, street names can move. In Limerick, over the period of the late 18th century, there were three pump lanes all next to each other. Uh, so there are also colloquial names. There are names that are no longer extant, the ones that are closed, there are ones that are bows. As I mentioned uh, earlier, in the, the, the importance of access down the sides of buildings and the langable um, uh, the properties to the rear, so buildings don't stand on their own. You have to have access to the the the, the, the full uh, block that's available. Uh, very quickly, these are just a, a, an idea of some of the maps that I had to georectify. So the modern OS map, uh, all the excavations up to about 2012, uh, 1900. Most importantly, from Brian Hawkinson, was he was mapping over a period of years all the estate maps that the Limerick Museum had availed to, so the Lords, um, the Earl of Limerick, the Dubesky Estate, um, the Lord Blessington, the Hoare Estate. Then again, the 1870 OS map, the the base core map would be map two. Um, I rectified the Collis map from 1776, uh, 1766, and also uh, previous work I did with the Limerick, Sof Limerick Civic Trust was to map the civil survey, the Cromwellian survey, uh, which uh, defined all the properties in, within the walls of Limerick in 1640 and then who owned them in 1656 as well. Um, in georectifying maps, you can't just plonk a map on a map. You can't just assume they will all line up. So you have to treat it by a block by block basis or by um, a borage, bar, borage by borage or even sometimes house by house. So here I just have like four quick maps, the modern OS map with the ITM coordinates, what that would look with the Griffiths valuation with the 1870s map, going back further with the Hoare estate map, something happened, all the houses wouldn't fit, and I knew the laneways already existed, and the same with the civil survey, so we figured out that 
at a period in the early 19th century that Bridge Street, or then Key Lane, was widened to make room for Athlunker Street moving out. And without knowing that, you can assume that the streets start here and you count up. But you have to be cognizant to make sure that with demolition, buildings can be joined. The plot boundaries themselves generally stay the same. But you have to figure out exactly how much information, which information you can get for each particular building. Um, I decided to use the Griffiths valuation um, because on the Ask About Ireland site, there is an online map that shows that there is a numbering system for um, it's not a street system, it's a numbering system for every house a, on English Town, with the medieval High Street and later uh, Mary Street and Nicholas Street going down the spine with the herringbone effect of all the medieval borish plots going either side. And on the left is a, just a quick table of just some of the, the archival material that I, I was trying to map. So I had the base map of the Civil Survey, I had the rate valuation books, census, um, ordnance survey, all the estate maps, so I, I was able to fix them in the streetscape. So then it was like with that information and only with that information could I even think of to start to uh, identify the locations um, of um, structures that are referred to in the Registry of Deeds. And as well as that, I'm not saying just because my uncle's an architect, I do like drawing, uh, uh, drafting maps, but I was getting interested in, in, in doing 3D models as well because Limerick Museum has thousands of uh, photographs, many of which from the Lawrence Collection, many of which are reproduced uh, in other sites. But often, like the one on the top left is Jay Lane looking up by the Tulsil, and you're kind of going, what is to the left of that photograph? If, if only he just did this and took another photograph. So I decided if you can get all the photographs together, how much of the streetscape can you have? And also I found that if you have like the 1920s, 1930s, and then 18th century and the 19th century, if you, if you recreate the streetscape and actually can put a place to a name, you can almost put a face to a name almost, where I actually cared more about the archival information if I knew what the building looked like, what the streetscape and the wider uh, streetscape looked like. Um, just as a case study, I just picked one building. Um, on Nicholas Street number 27, which is uh, redeveloped by uh, Limerick, City, Limerick City and County Council. Uh, they excavated the, the medieval cellar and they uh, re redid the, the entire building. Um, and the, the medieval plot goes all the way back about 80 feet. So just very, very quickly. So from the civil survey at the very, at the very top from 1654, so that in, 18, in 1640 it's Andrew Oak Cray then through Registry of Deeds in 1714, 1718, then it's still referred to as Anne Cray's property. In the mid-19th century, the Devesky lords, the Longford and Devesky, are still referring to the house as Anne Cray's old house. Uh, then you have things like Mac Michael McNamara and Charles Copley are referred to in subsequent uh, deeds and records as well. And then you get to things like Ferrer's Directory, um, obituaries were incredibly important and bit by bit by bit if you take all the street instead of looking at one building if you take all the streetscape as a whole instead of having um, a pre-numbering system trade directory if you have all the names available all the owners all the occupiers it actually makes it a lot, not to say that it's easy but it makes it a lot more sense to be able to give um, an almost this goes down up to 1971 and gets into GDPR as to how you can share information. So I decided to stop it at 1919. So I gave a tour of the men's shed of their own building, kind of giving them context of the building and the streetscape that they've inherited um, on uh, the former medieval high street. And this is just an idea of when you do it one house, this is only one half of Nicholas Street. There's the other half and all of Mary Street as well. So it kind of goes to show that how how far can you go? How far can you want to go? And what happens to all this digital information once it finds a home? Thank you very much, John. Um, and I think you can see the amount of sources that have gone into that. I think one of the themes that has come across is this layering um, in, in both of the presentations, the layering of information and the amount of sources that you can combine, and that's one of the benefits of digital mapping. So um, I'll see if we have any questions, um, both uh, here and online. Does there want someone in the back there? <laughs> Uh, 
there's a question addressed to, to Brian, really, but uh, actually referencing what John said there at your last quote, that you, you know, how far do you go or where you stop? And I was, I was going to ask Brian um, th th that, that question in a sense that, uh, uh, what's the line out of Moby Dick? Is it uh, Ishmael said, it's not down in any map, real places never are. You know that famous line, but that d how far do you see mapping? Uh, you know, I I is it, I obviously this is called the historic town atlas, y but you know the work of what the American writer, is it Rebecca Solnit writes, she's maps of New York and or San Francisco and LA, she maps unusual things like where murders took place and I, I suppose really I'm, I'm just echoing what John said how far do you could you see this going I mean uh, you know how many layers do you have where do you stop it's going all the way <laughs> <laughs> but I mean th the thing is who's to who's to legislate for what's interesting so potentially any point on the surface of the earth uh, or above or below is interesting to someone and who's to say they shouldn't explore it? But then there's the kind of res resource that you need in order to be able to explore it accurately. So, um, and this is the value of the atlas. So it's, it's, it's about doing the scholarly work and then making it available to people. It's the, it's the problem that Blahin was talking about this morning about how do you overcome the intimidation of the the non the the the, feel, the, the amateurs the, who the interested amateurs of whatever age, from school children upwards, lifelong learners, of getting involved in this, and it's to give them a tool that um, that see that that that, that uh, what John's just been talking about is highly detailed and highly uh, geo, the geo rectification of maps is is very difficult, but it's it's. Uh, it's, and, but doing it by eye on a table where you've got all the maps spread out, is, it's, that's mind-bogglingly difficult. It, once you bring them in like that, but the skill required to do that is enormous. But once you've done it, then your men, the men in your men's shed can take it further. And they can then find out additional information that professional researchers are never likely to go into and add it and make it available to people. Any other questions? Yes, we have one here. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid I have multiple questions, actually. Um, uh, one to Brian about uh, how do you, do are people allowed to add to this atlas and how do you monitor the content? And the bigger question to both of you uh, I've often thought about doing a map of harbors uh, and start making all the work I've done public, but how do you, how does anyone maintain a digital resource indefinitely if you're not the RIA or if you're not, well, how do you do it? It's all in chapter 12. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, but, si but simply it's that th this doesn't involve doing any violence to the Irish Historical Towns Atlas, it's integrity. So that, but it's about um, making that resource available for people to do, to add in. So I'd got an audio clip. As we went round, I had my mobile phone and I was voice recording Mark Lusby as he spoke. So I, I've got an edited clip of, uh, well, two clips. One, you know, one's just a minute and the other one's seven minutes of him talking about that particular spot. Um, but, but then it's to do this systematically and to get people to cooperate. So you need a systematic framework that, that you've got institutional commitment to sustaining. So I talk, in the last chapter, I talk about another very this clever acronym, CALM, colleges, archives, libra libraries, and museums, all collaborating institutionally in developing a project like this and using the kind of GIS technology that's been available in schools, Skullnet in the South, NI maps in the north, that w w this is uh, upper primary, lower secondary, as well as right the way on through to, to, to graduate level. This isn't technology that's beyond the, the, the there's, there's bespoke technology now that makes it quite easy for upper, pri upper primary, lower secondary school children to operate this, to import into a GIS environment, a digital file, an audio file, or their own text, and to, to locate it. This is, um, 
So, but it's about, but you're making the point about um, you want to be able to sustain it. I was talking to Keith earlier and he said, well, you know, uh, oh, sustainability of websites, they, they can vanish, can't they? This is why you need buy-in over generations to make this possible. And it's the point that was made earlier about the European comparisons, that there ought to be technically a global approach to this. That, because who's going to say what point on the surface of the earth I'm not interested in? Well, you told me, Rachel, you've got an interest in Hong Kong. Did you? Did you not? Way back, yes. Way back. Yes. <laughs> well, you might not be interested in it anymore, but, but, but I mean, who, who's... So it's about, and it's, it's about providing support for people to research the places that they've got an interest in. If you want to get people interested in, they want to see, you know, we've said it, it's been said several times today already, if you want people, uh, people are interested in particularly the places with which they are familiar for one reason or another. And of course, who's not interested in the place where they live, that, uh, particularly their house, or uh, some institution that they've got a particular connection with. So it's about, it's a big, it's a big ask, but, but what I, IHTA has done is provided a wonderful foundation on which to build. Um, I'd agree wholeheartedly with Brian, and even the, the previous question of like, where does this start? Um, the Star Times Atlas and its work and it tr as a trans-European template and how cross-pollination between and multidisciplinary cross-pollination is fantastic. But once you get into the digital side, it's not, it doesn't, it's not the, the end of the war because it's a website that has to be curated. And the yeah. curation of digital archives is a real problem because there's so much money going into the digitalization, but not the interface. Yeah, yeah. So I've always thought by doing the streetscape or mapping entire medieval cities is the property boundary, the, instead of a dot on a map, it's the polygon, the property boundary of that building and yeah. excavating down and its development later. Each building is the repository of geographic, historical information and genealogical information. So once it's defined per property and per street and per streetscape and per trade, that's the ITM, that's hard, finite. Once the information is located like that, then you can get beyond worrying about the limitations of having to create and update an online digital ESRI uh, GIS map. Can I just add the point about Gobner Scale, because it's about townland studies. If you go to the IHTA for Derry and you live in Gobner Scale, you're not going to find yourself, um, except only tangentially in some of the, uh, the images. But it's, it's, about, it's, about, it's the problem that IHTA is wrestling with about, you know, the, um, the, 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 it's the town and its hinterland or hinterlands, and it's about the Dublin suburbs being done now. Where, again, how far do you go with, with the hinterland? And I think we've got to be thinking about the entire island, I think, and, and supplying, um, I mean, uh, um, the, the townland studies integrated with the urban studies because what's interesting is the relationship. Bonfire site just outside the city walls targeted at the Catholic community on the other side of the river in Godner Scale. <coughs> you can't understand one without the other. Um, another question here. Thank you. My question is actually to both of you because I was absolutely fascinated by both projects and I was just wondering, um, because you are in a way enabling people to, to, to learn more and to do more themselves, um, do you uh, or have you got a project that, that you roll out where you tell people how to do this? I suppose what I really want to know is can I invite either of you to come to Waterford at some stage? <laughs> I, like, I do, do, Could I do she afford us? That's I a question. Is Nicholas, but I do enjoy doing walking tours. And for things like the men's shed or Treaty City Brewery, the two doors down, as a kind of a gift by the council, I took upon myself to kind of like welcome to the neighbourhood the oldest part of the city. Here's the history of, of your place. It's, it's place making in inverted commas. It belongs to all of us. It's, I'm going through maps done by the government or rate valuation books or census. It's all public information. You're just ordering the pile more neatly. It's not my information. It's theirs. It's everyone's. So. Happy, very happy to come and talk, yeah. <laughs> 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 we have one here and, and then the second one. 
Oh, sorry. Ju just uh, one point in relation to, uh, to John, uh, the digging through the various resources and trying to figure out does this refer to that property or that property. Um, one of the things that I found that completely confused me in going through the trade directories was that the street numbering systems varied. Uh, and in fact, between the two censuses, the 1901 and the 1911 censuses, uh, the same properties where you could, you know, where there were the same people still in them, had different street numbers. Uh, was that something that is, is, is widely a problem? Even today on Nicholas Street, there are two number 19s, two number 44s. Um, you do, but I, I, by using the Griffiths valuation, I was basically like, give each plot and each property boundary an individual code that's linked. I basically, I just geo director and use, I was using air code. I didn't have to map out. So basically by doing that, when like before, before trade directories, there was no numbering system. You gave a letter and they went to the sign of the globe or the local page boy would know where to go. By, ha by knowing the owner and lessor and occupant, that helps to tighten it. And then if you, if you know a sequence of a couple of houses and then the numbering system has changed, you can invert it, flip it. It's a game of square pusher sometimes. Yeah. Uh, but eventually you are limited by the amount of buildings on the street. Streets, c lanes can get, can be widened, so you might lose a building. Two properties might be conjoined and something else built, but you're still limited by the geography of the streetscape. Uh, just to add, the, the fourth prototype of the CALM prototype is a study of uh, the, the house that Kay and I live in, 436 Ravenhill Road, built 1906. But I think until 1948, it was 336. <laughs> so it's it's a... And these are the these are the technical problems that that f people find very off-putting. I think um, can easily be put off if they're not encouraged, which is what Blind's doing. I think. One more question down here. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, um, this is a question for John. Can you, you can hear this? Um, I carried out a similar project for Ennis, not maybe as deep as you went, but. Uh, I was able to use registry of deeds and a whole lot of other sources to place people in certain properties and all of that. <laughs> My question is, when you have all that information gathered and put into neat piles, what do you do with it? Are there any conclusions you draw? I mean, I was looking at my stuff and, you know, uh, one street was mainly drapers, the other one's grocers. Um, you know, I was trying to draw conclusions after a, a lot of hard graft. What conclusion did you draw for Mary Street or Nicholas Street after you had all that information gathered? 19 landlords and a, a streetscape in decline. Um, over time, like unfortunately with the Registry of Deeds, after 1708, often they refer to previous deeds in, in the 16th, 17th century. Unfortunately, they just, the scribe is paid by words, so he'll often just copy and paste the previous one which is great for being able to tie back something to the 18th century, but is nothing to you if you're looking at something in the mid 19th century. Um, from when you glean the, as the streetscape changes and when you are able to link a family or a household to a particular building, you kind of see uh, like the cholera epidemic. I came across by using the, the online resources through the trade directories, I was able to locate houses or even just the the, the obituaries from the Limerick Chronicle in the early 19th century where there was one family over a period of three weeks, the father died, the mother died, three of the children died. Next week, there's a letter by the editor saying, if please remember this family, like their two children are orphaned. So there are horrendous stories, but uh, like you're tricking the street as a whole. It's amazing the stories you can garner for it. Um, for Limerick City itself, like the, the, the main core of the city had moved to, uh, to, in, to Newtown Parry. Yeah. So the corporation hung on to dear life for another 40 years and the uh, St. Michael's Municipal Commission uh, were the main um, uh, governance and South Prior's land in Newtown Parry. The old corrupt corporation um, were redoing, the, the, the mayority house only lasted 30 years, the exchange turned into uh, a school and then they eventually moved to Rutland Street. 
it's basically, it's like in Henrietta Street, a grand street that turns into tenements and is just late forgotten. The old brick front falls down and then turns into clearance. It's right, but you can see, like, those kind of conclusions. Uh, those kind of, you know, you draw that out of the material. You know, I found there were much easier ways to get that kind of information than doing that kind of micro research into each singular building. So I'm, d I'm just wondering, is it really necessary? That just a general a point. Case study to see how much information can you get and how much can you map? Because there is like, it's not just about the main high street and what happened is, can this be replicated for the entire metropolis or to other towns and other urbans or uh, uh, small towns and villages even? I'm afraid we're almost on um, quarter two now, so I think we'll have to um, finish the session here. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you to our two speakers, uh, Brian and John. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we could have carried on talking for quite a lot longer on some of the themes that you raised there, but thanks very much. Thank you.